Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to go through the interpretation and initial management of sterile pyuria, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. The information is based on two relevant medical publications in the British Journal of General Practice, as well as the New England Journal of Medicine. The links to them are in the episode description. If you want a reminder on how to manage non-visible hematuria, Please watch the corresponding episode on this channel. The link is in the episode description too. Right, so let's jump into it. Sterile pyuria is not an uncommon finding in clinical practice. 9% of patients with urinary symptoms and who are suspected of a UTI are found to have sterile pyuria. It can be higher in specific populations and sterile pyuria is more common amongst women because of the higher incidence of pelvic infection. Sterile pyuria continues to pose a diagnostic conundrum because there are no guidelines on its management. Furthermore, no agreed definition for sterile pyuria exists. It is simply the presence of white blood cells in the urine in the absence of infection. Some authors have defined it as the presence of 10 or more white cells per cubic millimeter of urine, 3 or more white cells per field on microscopy, or a urinary dipstick test that is positive for leukocytes, all of these in the absence of positive urine cultures. Sterile pyuria can also be associated with hematuria, proteinuria and casts, complicating the diagnosis. Looking at the causes, broadly speaking, sterile pyuria may be classified as infectious or non-infectious. Let's look at the infectious causes first. Simple bacterial UTIs are extremely common. However, a recently treated UTI, usually within two weeks, or even after a single dose of antibiotics, can present a sterile pyuria. Therefore, we should check whether a recent course of antibiotics has been given, and, if we're treating a UTI and requesting a urine culture, we should advise patients to collect the urine sample before taking the first dose of antibiotics. When considering UTIs, we also need to take into account that although colony counts greater than 100,000 colony-forming units per millimetre of urine have historically been used to diagnose a UTI, bacterial colony counts as low as 1,000 can be a sign of bacteriuria. So it is important to consider that lower bacterial counts can still be associated with urinary tract infections, even though the urine cultures may be reported as negative. So in these cases, repeating the cultures may be necessary. Sexually transmitted infections should be considered in the younger sexually active population. Chlamydia is the most common cause, but others are also possible, such as, for example, gonorrhea, mycoplasma, trichomonas, genital herpes and HPV. Therefore, a sexual history should always be sought in young patients presenting with urinary symptoms in the older population, prostatitis, cystourethritis and balanitis may also present a sterile pyuria. Furthermore, common viruses such as adenoviruses and parasitic infections such as schistosomiasis can also be a potential cause of sterile pyuria, so we should inquire about foreign travel. In patients with chronic sterile pyuria, atypical infections should be considered, in particular renal tuberculosis, which is suspected in patients coming from endemic regions, the immunocompromised, and those presenting with unintentional weight loss. Genitory urinary tuberculosis is the most common form of non-pulmonary tuberculosis after lymphadenopathy. And finally, fungal infections can also be a cause of sterile pyuria. Pyuria has also been noted in the absence of infection, so let's have a look now at the non-infectious causes. So obvious causes include pelvic inflammation secondary to, for example, appendicitis, radiotherapy involving the pelvis and urinary tract, instrumentation like, for example, cystoscopy, and indwelling catheters and urinary stents. However, if there's not a clear cause, we must consider other causes such as local disease, including malignancy, systemic disease, and medication. Let's look at these causes a little bit more in detail. Sterile pyuria can be found in patients with local disease, 
from benign conditions like renal stones to malignancy. When presenting with either visible or non-visible hematuria, we should always investigate the cause, referring the patient if appropriate. Possible causes of sterile pyuria and hematuria are malignancy, polycystic kidney disease, and renal papillary necrosis, which can be typically seen in patients with diabetes, sickle cell disease, and long-term analgesic use. Systemic conditions that can cause sterile pyuria include SLE, Kawasaki disease, diabetes, sarcoidosis, and malignant hypertension. There are also physiological causes such as postmenopausal changes and pregnancy. Therefore, repeated sterile pyuria with negative cultures during antenatal checks could be physiological, although we should always exclude other conditions too. Finally, medications are also a common cause of sterile pyuria. Olsalazine and mesalazine used to treat inflammatory bowel disease and nitrofurantine have been reported to cause sterile pyuria. Additionally, penicillin-based antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirin, PPIs and diuretics have also been involved in acute drug reactions causing tubulin interstitial nephritis with sterile pyuria. Let's summarize all this by looking at this algorithm published in the British Journal of General Practice. So, the common causes include infectious and non-infectious. Infectious causes include STIs, as well as parasitic and atypical infections. And examples are unresolved UTIs, prostatitis, cystourethritis, balanitis, post-antibiotic pyuria, chlamydia, gonorrhea, schistosomiasis and adenoviruses. In the non-infectious causes, if there is an intentional weight loss, we will think of malignancy or renal tract TB. If there's a history of previous surgical procedures or pelvic radiotherapy, then the cause could be indwelling catheters, ureteric stents, cystoscopy and post-intra-abdominal surgery or pelvic radiation. If there is hematuria, we will think of renal calcula, malignancy, polycystic kidney disease, renal papillary necrosis, and interstitial nephritis. If we're thinking of systemic conditions, we will consider SNE, Kawasaki, diabetes, pregnancy, malignant hypertension, postmenopausal changes, and interstitial cystitis. And finally, if we're thinking of drugs, we will check for the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids, olsalazin, penicillin, vancomycin and PPIs. How do we manage sterile pyuria? First of all, we will start with a detailed clinical history and examination to help us identify a possible cause. General findings like hypertension, skin rashes and edema can be signs of a more serious underlying pathology. Abdominal and pelvic examination, including a digital rectal examination and vaginal examination in females, may be necessary. Then we will move to carry out some investigations, generally in the form of urine tests, blood tests and imaging of the urinary tract. As urine tests, urinalysis and urine cultures are the prime investigations for sterile pyuria. Importantly, sterile pyuria is not always sterile, so as mentioned earlier, repeating urine cultures often yields a positive result on subsequent testing. Contamination, especially with vaginal leukocytes in females, is common, and samples should always be collected as a midstream urine clean catch. If sterile pyuria is detected during routine screening tests, sending a urine sample for culture is recommended with onward review for further investigation pending the results. For sexually active patients, a urine test or in some cases swaps for chlamydia and gonorrhea are also recommended. Other investigations to be considered are routine blood tests, including a full blood count, renal and liver function tests. Eosinophilia is an important marker of drug-induced interstitial nephritis, but it may also be seen in parasitic infections such as schistosomiasis. Finally, if imaging is required, the type depends on the presentation. 
a renal tract ultrasound scan or CT is recommended when renal stones, masses or nephritis are differential diagnoses. Other procedures such as a cystoscopy are recommended if tumours are suspected, although they also have the advantage of diagnosing and treating benign pathologies such as bladder stones. The New England Journal of Medicine has proposed a flowchart on how to manage patients presenting with sterile pyuria. Let's have a look at it. If a patient presents with sterile pyuria, we will review the clinical presentation. If the symptoms are primarily local, like pelvic pain, urinary or urethral symptoms, then we will investigate for conditions like, for example, STDs, prostatitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. And if these are not detected, we will consider alternative diagnoses like urinary stones, foreign bodies, interstitial cystitis, bladder tumours and schistosomiasis, particularly if the patient has travelled to a high-risk area such as Africa. On the other hand, if the symptoms are primarily systemic, like a fever, other systemic and urinary symptoms, or back, abdominal or pelvic pain, then we will reassess for bacterial infection by repeating bacteriological studies and cultures. And if bacteria are found, then we will treat accordingly. And if bacteria are not detected, we will consider alternative diagnoses such as tuberculosis or fungal infections, especially if they are immunocompromised or they have been in endemic or high-risk areas. And if no infection is detected, then appropriate referral will be the next step. And that is it, a brief review of the causes and initial management of sterile pyuria. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.